All right, well, it's two o'clock. Um, we'll give stragglers maybe a, a couple minutes, unless, Jen, you can see that people are um, already or? It looks like there's eight of us, including you and I. So um, I think it's okay to go ahead and get started. Um, if people wanna join in, then that's fine. Okay, well then I'll go ahead and do it. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, approximately one hour, a little more webinar that's orienting you to pesticide applicator training as well as fertilizer. So uh, believe me, I we all understand that you do a lot of things besides just PAT, but um, thank you for being with us for this hour because hopefully some of the stuff we're going to share with you will be helpful. So please barge in and ask questions. Otherwise, I'll just get started. Um, okay, first time I tried to advance a slide, <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> did you click on the, make sure you click on the screen. Okay, I just did that. It's funny, Jen and I tested this just uh, like 10 minutes ago, it was working perfectly. So I don't know what I'm doing wrong, Jen. Can you advance it? Sure. Sorry, folks. Okay, uh, just start out with a few acronyms. If you're really new, you might be confused by the PAT and the fact and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm getting the notice to click, Jen, so I think I can take control. But okay. these are just some important acronyms that we'll use uh, basically in this webinar. Um, so the trainings, PAT, FACT, uh, we talk about recert, we're talking about recertification of the pesticide license or the fertilizer license. Uh, PSEP, that's us, and you can also call us Pest Ed. So without too much more about that, we'll move on. And I still can't move on. Sorry, Jen, you're going to have to advance. Okay, so what are we going to cover today? Um, a little bit of background about why we do PAT, just to give you a little background about the laws and regs, and then more or less the mechanics of doing it, setting up a meeting, what the ODA's expectations, uh, expectations are, and about the teaching resources that, uh, that we provide to you. At the very end, we're going to talk about something called the Worker Protection Standard, which is a set of federal regulations that you need to know about, but we aren't going to be able to go into that in depth. Okay, so first of all, to understand pesticide law, you have to know how they uh, define pesticides and a pest. Uh, just very simply, a pest is just about any type of living organism that you want to control. So whether it's a bacteria or a virus or a rodent or insect, insect, et cetera. Also, from the standpoint of pesticide regulations, pesticides include plant growth regulators, crop desiccants, crop defoliants. All right, the one important federal law that you all need to know about is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. So this is the law that basically gives the US EPA authority to regulate the sales, distribution, and use of pesticides in the US. It also gives them authority to require uh, registration and labeling of all pesticides sold in the United States. Now, the thing we're gonna really focus in on is this thing called certification. This is also set up under FIFRA. So from the federal loss viewpoint, so to speak, um, certification is required only for restricted use products. Okay, so uh, taking a look at that restricted use designation there, that's actually a, a piece of a label there. The EPA at the time of registration, they are gonna decide whether something's restricted use or not. And it's usually due to toxicity or environmental hazard or something like that. So uh, back to this question of certification, what does it mean? Certification means that you have demonstrated a certain level of competence, in this case, enough competence to apply restricted use pesticides. So in Ohio, how do you become certified to use restricted use pesticides? You do it by passing exams. And it's not a once and done deal. Everyone must recertify their pesticide license every three years. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit more to give you the background of who does what. Okay, so we've talked about the US EPA. 
So on the national scale, uh, they register all the pesticides, approve the labels, decide what's an RUP, and also determine those minimum requirements for certified pesticide applicators. Um, worker protection standard, which we're gonna touch on in the end, they also have the authority to um, oversee that. In Ohio, it's the ODA that is the state lead agency for pesticides. So they have an agreement with the US EPA to basically enforce federal law, federal pesticide law in, in Ohio. And also, of course, they enforce the state pesticide laws. There's a lot under state pesticide law. We're going to talk from this point on mostly about state laws. So the st Ohio requires a separate registration for every pesticide sold in, in Ohio. And it can set up its own certification requirements for pesticide applicators. So I already kind of made this distinction on the federal level. The EPA only requires certification for users of restricted use products. In Ohio, we're going to see that in some situations, uh, certification is required regardless of the type of pesticide, whether it's restricted use or not. So they also do the licensing, they do the pesticide inspections. Okay, so where do we all fit in this? Okay, so OSU Extension has a role. So there's an MOU between OSU and the Ohio Department of Agriculture. We are the training partners. And then specifically, there is a funding agreement between my program, the Pesticide Safety Education Program, and the Ohio Department of Agriculture as well. So we have certain responsibilities to do training, uh, do pesticide manuals, help them with exams, and a ah, whole bunch of other stuff. So that's enough about the framework. So I guess I like these complicated slides. So just looking at what we do, Okay, I want you to understand on the left there, what my program does is we do a lot of commercial pesticide applicator training. We have full day programs that uh, train new applicators and recertify existing ones. And as I already mentioned, um, do manual and exam development. Now, on the private pesticide applicator side of things, um, we work with you in the counties to do the certification training. And we provide to you through our pesticide in-service and some of the materials that we put together, the means to do the training in the counties. So on each side of things, commercial or private, we have almost 13,000 applicators on each side. Commercial categories 26, um, private seven. And we're gonna talk more about those categories on the private side here in a little bit. Okay, so a little bit more about the actual licensing. Um, okay, well, first of all, I have a slide in here about the state uh, registration that's required for pesticides. So in addition to federal registration, all pesticides have to have a state registration. Um, what I'm showing you here is the way that you find out if a pesticide actually is registered in this state. Um, there's an online database called NPERS, and anybody can use this system to, uh, you click on your state, and you can search by product name, active ingredient, manufacturer to find out if indeed the product's registered. It is not legal to use a product in Ohio that doesn't have the, both the federal and the state registration. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the licensing. So I've already started talking about commercial and private. So now I need to kind of backtrack and define those. Um, commercial pesticide licenses are required for any type of pesticide, not just restricted use, if you use them in these situations. So number one, any type of pesticide application made for hire. Then there's a whole bunch of other situations under Ohio pesticide law. So if you work for any public entity, you know, whether that's Ohio State University or ODOT, any type of schooling or daycare, uh, university required if you're applying pesticides on the job, um, any type of medical facility, any type of food handling uh, establishment, golf courses, and then finally, um, people that have rental properties with more than four units in one place, 
all of these situations, if you're applying pesticides, you have to have this commercial pesticide license. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to show you some of the brochures that um, our programs put together for you to use because you know you can't be expected to remember all of this stuff. Um, so we kind of put together the handy dandy brochures and you can download them from our website. Now the private pesticide applicators, which is of most interest to you, the ANR educators, because you're doing the training for them. These are people that use or supervise the use of restricted use pesticides in the production of agricultural commodities. So furthermore, on your own property or your employer's property. So this is gonna be the farmers, this is gonna be the greenhouse growers, nursery growers, orchardists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, note that the growers only are required to have the license if they're using restricted use products. They don't actually have to have a license if they only use general use products. Um, by and large though, your, your farmers, your grain farmers, and your greenhouse growers, they are more than likely going to have some key restricted use products that, well, at least are commonly used in um, their cropping systems. Okay, uh, getting the license, I'll kind of quickly cover this. Uh, we have another brochure that you're welcome to use available on our website that kind of explains the whole process. So number one, um, your farmers can get the study materials from you. <laughs> if you're new, this might come as a surprise. We encourage the county educators to have uh, the study materials specifically for core in category one and two, um, have those on hand in the office. If you're not sure where you get these, you can get them through OSU Extension Publications. And of course, your clientele can get them directly from them as well. Uh, the uh, farmer can register for a test um, and they're held throughout the state. Um, the, they go online or they can place a phone call to the ODA to set this up if they prefer. You have to take two different tests and we're going to explain what those are here in a little bit. You have to pass exams in core, which is sort of the basics of applying pesticides and safe and effective use of pesticides in, it, in a category um, that, in, that is basically the crops that you're you're treating. Jenny's going to cover those categories shortly. So if, if you pass, um, the ODA mails you an application. You have to return that application with a license fee of $30. The ODA mails out the license that's good for farmers or for private applicators rather for three years. So each uh, March 30, 31st, three years after you obtain the license, your license will come up for both recertification as well as uh, renewing with payment. So farmers licenses or private applicators license last three years and so does their uh, recertification requirement. Okay, let's look, talk a little bit about the core exam uh, versus the category exam. Once again, core is the basics of applying pesticides. Um, I won't cover this in, in uh, I guess, in, in a lot of depth here, but basically the laws and regulations Pesticide label is a very important part of this exam. About 30% of the questions will ask you to read and uh, answer questions about an actual pesticide label. That's very really important because that's what the, what the private applicator is going to have to do when they're applying pesticides. Then there's uh, probably about 15% of the questions are on safety, uh, another 15% on best practices, uh, also environmental hazards, a few pesticide calculations, and some questions about general pesticide characteristics. All right, I'm gonna let Jenny take over now. All right, so we are going to go through the private categories individually, um, just so you are aware of what fits into which category. So category one is grain and cereal crops, and this is gonna be um, required for any uh, restricted use pesticide applied to row crops. So for example, corn, grain, sorghum, um, soybeans. Category two is for any restricted use pesticide um, in a forage crop and livestock. This is going to include crops grown primarily for use as hay, forage, fodder, or silage. 
and any application made to the animals themselves and their living quarters. Category three is fruit and vegetable crops. So this pertains to orchards, small fruits, brambles, um, anything grown in the field, vegetables and other horticultural crops that are grown for human consumption. And this includes sweet corn. Category four is gonna be your nursery and forest crops. Um, so any- Jenny, so sweet corn is not gonna be under category one, it's gonna be under category three. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so any commercial nursery crops, um, including container grown or field grown ornamentals, um, Christmas trees, um, those are all gonna be included in category four. Now, anything that's grown in a greenhouse is not included in four. That'll be included in five, which is greenhouse crops. Okay, so anything grown in a covered facility is gonna be category five, and that's going to include high tunnels. Category six is fumigation. Um, now, a lot of our applicators are actually already grandfathered into this category before we condense them down to fewer categories. You don't actually have too, too many people trying to get um, certified in this particular category, but a lot of people want to hold on to it, so they will get recertified in it. Um, so this is going to include all restricted use fumigants to soil, grain storage, greenhouses, and other confined areas. And then we have our category seven. This is specialty use. Um, this one is kind of unique. Um, it's restricted use applications for anything not covered in categories one through six. So let's say I'm already a licensed applicator in category one, so I can legally make applications to grain crops, and I now want to grow hops. So I do not need to get category seven by itself now because I'm already licensed in category one. Okay, now if I want to, if I'm not licensed in anything and I all of a sudden want to go out and start growing hops or start doing tobacco or something like that, then I can go in, I can test into core and category seven and be only licensed in category seven. Now, this one's kind of unique in that I, I'm pretty sure the exam is literally only like one question, but you do still have to pass core. Okay, do I have any questions on that? Because that might be a little bit confusing. So again, if you already have categories one through six, you're licensed in any of those categories, you do not have to be licensed specifically in seven to make applications to any of these other specialty crops. Okay, I hear silence, so I'm assuming that everyone understands that. Okay. So if you have, if you have, a, uh, if you have any one of those one through six, you don't need seven? No. You can okay. legally make any applications to what would fall under category seven. And I'm assuming um, that hemp is going to be falling under this category as well Thanks at some point. Yeah, so yeah. Okay, so study materials, Mimi's kind of already hinted about this. Um, these are items that you um, should have on hand in the county for people that come in. Um, the category one, two, and core information is all um, available again on the e-extension publication site. You can purchase those and then charge whatever you'd like for your um, applicators. Um, it it de just depends on the county. Um, some educators just like to print them out and lend them to the person and then expects them to return them back. You know, if you want to charge, that's fine. If you don't, that's great. It's, it's up to the county. Um, the remaining categories are all available as PDFs for no charge on our website, um, I believe as well as the Ohio Department of Agriculture's website. Um, if you want to have these printed out on hand as PDFs, you're welcome to do that as well. Again, entirely up to you. Um, I will also say, I don't know if I have a slide on it. Um, I do, okay. So, um, 
in addition to the study manuals that we have, um, I will say that there are a lot of additional references available for certain categories. And those are actually fair game for exam questions. And I don't think a lot of educators realize that. Um, so we do highly recommend that you have some of these additional references on hand as well to give out. And if these are items that you don't wanna necessarily purchase and sell on, maybe you just you know buy a couple of these and then just lend them out as needed or upon request. Um, but it has come up recently that you know people felt that questions um, you know that they didn't see in the study manual were unfair on the exam and according to the ODA these additional references are absolutely fair game to come up with questions so I do want to make that um, pretty clear um, <clears throat> those additional references Jenny are those um, if I do the click down additional references on your website are those all going to be listed there yes okay Yes, um, a lot of them are just free to download as PDFs. Some of them you do need to buy. Like I know the, like for category two, the corn, soybean, wheat, and alfalfa field guide, um, you have to buy that, but I think it's like $12. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, terrible. So some um, of those I have, I just didn't, I'm looking at and see Ohio pesticide rules and Ohio pesticide law. And those are two things I know I don't have, but I probably should get, so. Yeah. Yeah, or at least, again, just have a couple, a couple of PDFs on hand and just lend them out to people. Right. Just one comment. I, I think the laws that are in the core, private core book, that little chapter is sufficient for the laws on the exam. That Ohio pesticide law book is probably the law book that's given out at commercial, and it's, I mean, it's like all the pesticide law. So. Mm. Right, and so these are all available. I'm gonna go back um, on our pesticide safety education website. If you hover over the private, private applicator tab and then you can just scroll down to study materials, this particular um, page pops up and you can get all the materials from there. Okay, so what are the key responsibilities for our private pesticide applicators? First and foremost, to read and follow the label. Um, they are required to keep their pesticide records for a minimum of three years, and they also need to make them accessible to ODA should they be inspected. Uh, they need to be aware of key laws and responsibilities in the private proceedings book, um, which you will be getting at in-service this year. Um, those are going to include adverse effects, protecting honeybees and other pollinators, how to properly store pesticides, the worker protection standard, which I'll get to later here in the presentation, and then any use inconsistent with the pesticide label. So these are all key items, again, that are gonna be fair game for the core exam. Hey, hey and I just wanna jump in, because um, I'm the one that made this slide. Actually, once again, there's a law section in the actual private core study manual that would have I made the slide, it would have been better to refer to that. And that couple of pages actually does cover these things. All right, so what do we mean by use inconsistent with a label? So this, if you haven't heard this before, you will probably hear this a lot. It is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. So you cannot, and this is mandatory, use on a site not listed on the label. Ohio is a site specific state. Okay, so for example, if, um, if I have an insecticide that I can apply to golf courses only, okay, um, let's say the annual bluegrass weevil doesn't appear on that list, but I can still make that application on the annual bluegrass weevil as long as I'm making it on that golf course. Okay, now if it's for golf course use only and I go to apply it on my home lawn, then I am using it in a manner inconsistent with its labeling, and that is against the law. Okay, so we are site specific. So again, not all pests have to appear on the label, but the site must appear on the label. You also cannot use higher rates, use at more frequent intervals than stated on the label, exceed the total pounds per acre, or disregard any personal protective equipment on the label. And of course, you cannot ignore any directions for use. Off-target applications or drift, 
no persons shall apply pesticides to an area or crop in such a manner or at such a time that adjacent crops, pasture land, water, or other areas will be damaged or contaminated. Okay, so this is a pretty big thing, especially now with the whole dicamba issue. Um, so, um, and drift can be, you know, it can be a, from a liquid application. It could also be made with a dry granular application. So let's say I'm again using um, turf as an example. If I'm applying a granular to my turf and I leave granules on the sidewalk, that is still considered drift. Okay, so we want to make everyone very clear that any off-site off -site application of a pesticide is considered drift and the applicator can be held liable. Okay, over to Mimi. Okay, well back to me. Well, ANR educators have been teaching pesticide applicator training for decades, but fertilizer certification came along in 2014 with the Ohio Agricultural Nutrients Law, and it was definitely a response to the algal blooms in Lake Erie that have become so prominent in more recent years. Okay, so when is fertilizer certification required? If you apply fertilizer to more than 50 acres of agricultural production grown primarily for sale, and if you use fertilizer with a guaranteed analysis, okay, so manure, uh, lime, these are exempt. So we're talking fertilizer that has the NPK analysis. Um, if a farmer only uses fertilizers at planting time, the fertilizer is actually applied through the planter, they also are not required to have the fertilizer certificate. Mimi, if I may? Oh, please do. Okay. I was just going to say the, the first bullet point, um, a lot of people get confused with that, and we had to clarify this with Jim Belt out at the Ohio Department of Agriculture. So if you own or you farm more than 50 acres of an agricultural production, let's say I'm only applying to 10 acres on that day. Because I own and farm that agricultural production, I still have to be certified to apply that fertilizer, even though it's under that 50 acres. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's say let's say I own a thousand acres of corn. I'm making a fertilizer application to only 25 of those acres for whatever reason. You still have to be certified to apply that fertilizer. Yeah, that a lot of people would miss that. That's for sure. Okay. Uh, one thing to point out is who this doesn't affect. So this does not affect lawn and landscape and, and turf um, operators. So they are, this law does not apply to them at all. And the only other thing to point out in this slide is that here again, we have brochures available to you that explain the requirements that you're welcome to use. Okay, so how do you get the certification? So OSU extension, um, has been providing, ever since the beginning, uh, 2014, a three-hour training by which people can become certified. Alternatively, now there is an exam. So um, some of the counties are still offering the three-hour trainings, and you, you may want to do this. Um, probably good to talk to your era or your surrounding counties about who's doing what. Um, to use to actually do the training, the training manual is that uh, was put together by Harold Waters and Greg Labarge is used, and the PDF of this is available for your use. So, by the way, as far as I know, if you want to have Harold and uh, Greg come to your county, I believe they are still willing to come to uh, travel to do the initial trainings. Okay, so that's the initial training. Um, just FYI, if you have a, say, a new farmer or, um, you know, a second gen next generation farmer who's taking over from their parents, um, you want to always advise the farmer, if they're going to get both, to always get the pesticide license first, okay? This is assuming they're going to need both the fertilizer and the pesticide license. So why is this? 
because if you get the pesticide license first, then the fertilizer certification isn't any additional cost, and the reverse does not <laughs> is not true. Um, one other point is that when you hold both the pesticide license and the fertilizer uh, certificate, and they are distinct, um, the two uh, renewal schedules will uh, become coordinated. So uh, basically, the fertilizer schedule links up to the pesticide license renewal schedule. Hopefully, that was I said that clearly. Okay, so um, we've talked about how to get the license, the pesticide license, how do you get the fertilizer certificate. Now let's talk about recertification. So once again, recertification is required on an every three year basis. Um, this is how the pesticide applicator uh, shows that they're still competent to apply pesticides. So how do you do this? Okay, you can either do it by obtaining educational credits or by retaking and passing either the pesticide or the fertilizer exam. And most people don't like taking exams, so they will choose the educational route. So what do you need for pesticides? You need a total of three credit hours every three years, and that has to consist of a full hour of core and a minimum of a half hour in each of the categories on that license. So for fertilizer recertification, it's just one hour, uh, one hour of fertilizer research. Mimi, if I may jump in again. Of course. So it, let's just say hypothetically for the pesticide recertification, if somebody only has core and category one uh, grain and cereal crops on their license, so they'll need an hour of core, a half an hour in category one, that's only an hour and a half. So they will still need another hour and a half training, but that can be in any category. So that can be like another hour of core and another hour, another half an hour of category one, or it can be an hour in fruit and veg. It could be anything, um, but they still have to have a total of three, even if they only have core and one category on their license. Very important point. Yep. If you're holding a PAT program, it's going to typically be three hours. And so don't let anybody walk out early. <laughs> yeah. A uh, question on that, um, if you could go back to that last slide. Uh, sure. So for recertification, they need three credit hours total. Is that every year or over that three-year time period that the license is? It's over that three years. And another important point is, although people usually wait to the third year to recertify, they don't have to. I mean, they can get an hour in one year, and the next year another hour, and the third year one hour. But because PAT programs in the counties are typically three hours, generally people, um, they're coming that last year, but they don't, my point is they don't have to wait to the last year to, to get their three hours. So if, if we did a program that got them an hour of core and the half hour for category one, and they came to the program, you know, two out of three years, they would have enough hours to be recertified? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep, they don't have to do it all at once, just as long as they get it in within that three years. Yep, Hi, this is Stephanie. I had a quick question, question too. Uh, so the fertilizer one hour, that's on top of the three hours for pesticide? Correct. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah, a lot of educators are typically just doing they call it the three plus one meeting. So they're doing three hours of PAT with an hour of fertilizer, typically right before or sometimes after. So most, I would say 80% of the meetings that I've gotten in so far are the three plus one scenario. Because we do have essentially as many uh, fertilizer applicators recertifying this year as we do have um, private pesticide applicators, which is right around just over 4,000. Okay, uh, are there any other questions or? Okay, just want to let you know that that recert three-year recertification deadline, when it comes up, it's absolute. If they miss your uh, research program or they don't retake, they're going to have to retake the exam to keep the license. So there's no grace period. Whereas for actual license payment, 
Um, after March 31st in that third year, they're going to get a penalty, but they actually have a six-month grace period before they would have to actually take the exam again. Does that, does that make sense? So no grace period for education, but there is kind of a grace period for actually payment. Okay, I believe I pass this back to Jenny. Okay, so now we're going to talk about practical information for planning your research meetings. All right, so how many to expect at your meetings? So I have recently sent out emails to all of you um, with hopefully the number of applicators expiring and a list of all the applicators expiring in your counties. Um, if any of you don't have access to Box yet, please let me know and I will add you to the list and get you these. Um, there should be a massive, uh, like a universal list in Excel that you are welcome to sort through, use the sort function however you see fit. And then I've also sent out PDFs that were provided by the Ohio Department of Agriculture that should have listed all of your applicators and the research credits that they still need. Um, sometimes in very rare instances, you will have licensed applicators who have already received all of the recertification or continuing education credits that they need, but they're still appearing on this list, and that is simply because they have not turned in the $30 fee to the Ohio Department of Agriculture. So you might have a few farmers this year that have done that. Um, so again, um, since nearly all wait until the third year to recertify, we do have in our recertification cycles very big years, and some years we have really small years. So for example, last year, I think we had like 8,600 that were due to expire, and this year that's we have about half of that, just about 4,200. Um, so again, you, it's good to know this sort of thing in advance so you can prepare for your meetings. Uh, again, with these lists, um, we encourage you to, um, if you'd like, you know, create your own individual flyers, um, reach out to them, let them know that they still need recertification credits. Um, but we, PESTED, will be making um, flyers by the county um, that will actually go out in early December with the Ohio Department of Agriculture's renewal letter, and it will have all of your recertification meetings listed um, and fertilizer meetings listed on there so that they can um, attend. And those are good because we realize that not all applicators have internet or internet access in their areas. Um, so they can't necessarily refer to the, re the website to find out when these meetings are occurring. Uh, we also will be able to send you updated lists in late February and early March. Um, to catch those few stragglers, maybe they went on vacation to Florida or they simply just forgot. Um, so therefore, again, you can reach out to these folks if you'd like and just let them know, say, you know, hey, we realize you haven't recertified. I'm gonna be holding one final meeting at the beginning of March, please come. So the Ohio Department of Agriculture's database um, of about 13,000 private applicators, um, there is, from the educator tab on our webpage, there is a, an applicator lookup. So if you have their license application number, you can actually look them up and find out if they've recertified, if they've received all three credit hours, or what they still need to recertify in. Um, again, this massive Excel spreadsheet um, I put in Buckeye Box. You should all have access to that now, um, but we will also include that on the flash drive that we mail out to you um, just after the first of the year, which will also include all of the presentations from in-service. So again, for the private applicator renewal letters, these will be going out by the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Um, to indicate to the applicators that their license will be expiring in March. It will include their recertification status um, and also um, the, the flyers that we are making will include all of the county meetings. So I do encourage you if you are going to be having meetings either later this fall or early in the spring to make sure that you get those entered into the Ohio Department of Agriculture's um, the ODA portal. 
um, so that I can get those one advertised on our web page and get them on the flyer for you. So what should you charge for your recertification meetings? This is going to be entirely up to you. Um, a lot of eras or the eras of old, if you will, um, they like to have some sort of continuity between the counties. And a lot of them will just charge a $35 standard fee for pesticide training and a $10 fee for fact training. Now, I know that um, some counties don't charge at all. Um, that's completely up to them. Um, it's, yeah, there's really, I mean, we encourage you to charge because, I mean, no education should be free, right? Everything that you should have to say should have some sort of a value to it. Um, we encourage you not to char charge 30 because that is the same amount that the ODA charges their renewal fee. And a lot of times applicators will get super confused if they've mailed off the $30 fee to the o ODA and then you charge $30 as well. They're like, no, 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 I already paid you. And it's just super confusing. So definitely don't charge 30, charge less or more one way or the other. Um, again, some counties, are really lucky they can get sponsors for things like this. Some can't, so if you do wanna provide lunch, that fee can kind of incorporate some of the charges for food or printing costs, things like that. Um, again, this is just up to you based on your county. Um, I do recommend reaching out to your ERA reps, which again, we don't really call them ERA, era, excuse me, ERA reps. Um, but you can reach out to the era reps of old or your area leaders and kind of ask, you know, sort of what are the logistics in their county and you can kind of follow suit. Um, if you want to do pre-registration, that's up to you. Um, a lot of counties nowadays are just accepting walk-ins because they hate that 5.7 overcharge that goes to CVENT, that goes to the university. Um, so again, just completely up to you. So if you do decide to do online registration, um, the only way that we can accept credit card payments is going to be through this CVENT um, software that is now required by the university. Um, I'll go through that here in a little bit, but um, all PAT in fact earnings must be deposited into a specific university earnings fund. So everything basically kind of gets funneled statewide into one account, but then can get divvy up, divvied up by different funds and orgs. So um, if you're say co-hosting a meeting with some neighboring counties, you can easily divide that into two or three um, to, to split those earnings. That's very easy to do with the way that these funds are organized. Um, typically, um, most folks just wait until the end of the season to kind of divvy everything up and then just do one large transfer. Again, a lot of counties, essentially for every single PAT meeting, it's the same three or four educators that are just going around that era doing the teaching. Um, but again, keep in mind, if you do use the um, CVET for online credit card payments, that 5.7 um, gets charged to CVET and that'll be coming out of your accounts. Yeah, actually, can I step in here for a second? Yeah, of course. Yeah, the overhead is actually it's for everybody. So any funds that go into an earning fund, that fund 110790 gets charged university overhead. That's just a fact of university life basically. Okay, um, so hopefully everyone understands that you are not required to use CVENT or online registration, but it is the only platform we have to accept credit card payments. Um, the only caveat to that is even if you don't use online registration, um, the powers that be want you to, after the fact, go into CVENT and enter in all of your attendees that attended your trainings whether or not you charged or it was free. They want you to go in and keep track of all of the people that walked into your meeting for a training. Do I have any questions on that? Because sometimes that can be kind of a sore topic. Okay. 
All right, so is this still me? Yes. So who can teach a recertification class? So you do have to be, you do have to have the credentials. Not anybody can just go out and offer a recertification class and get the codes to distribute. So you need to be an OSU Extension educator, um, any non-OSU trainer, i.e. maybe somebody from industry, they have to submit their meeting agenda to the ODA and that has to be approved. Um, once it's approved and everything gets entered, then the ODA will distribute the codes for recertification. Um, the other thing about um, our meetings is they must be open to the public. Anytime we um, offer training for recertification credits, even if it's free, it has to be open to the public. It's, so that's, that's true of any PAT meeting, especially when it's some other than OSU entity. So again, just to kind of reiterate, your standard pesticide applicator training meeting will be three hours. Most people cover core categories one, two, and six. Those are kind of the, the big ones in the state. Um, some educators will offer all six categories in addition to core, um, but that's when, you know, having three or four educators at one training kind of comes in handy because you can split off groups. You can have, you know, if you've only got two applicators that have, you know, category three fruit and vegetable on their license, there's really no point in making everybody sit through that. You can, you know, go off to the side and have a separate training for those two or three applicators that need that category. And then your fertilizer recertification will be one hour. Um, again, I'm gonna say 80 to maybe even 90% of the meetings that I have had entered in so far already have that, um, the fertilizer before the PAT, um, only because you will often have fertilizer applicators only. And once that meeting is over, they can just leave. Whereas if you offer your PAT first, then you've got all these people, you know, trampling in three hours later just to attend the fertilizer meeting and it kind of can disrupt the training at that point. So a lot of people have it first or they'll have maybe like a half an hour break in between the end of their PAT meeting and the start of their fact. Just so you can kind of, you know, cause you're gonna need a few minutes to get through the recertification form and have everybody get things turned in. Um, so whatever's, easiest and most convenient for you, but that's kind of how most people are doing it. Um, if you're ever in doubt about the content that you're teaching, if you don't think it's appropriate for that category or core, or you think of something and you, th and you feel that it's, you know, should be included in core, but it's not something that we've talked about, you know, just give us a call and talk to us. We can discuss it with ODA and depending on what it is, you know, they might approve it. So as a &R educators, you need to enter your PAT and FACT meetings into the Ohio Department of Agriculture portal. Again, that is accessible through our um, Pest Ed webpage under the Educator tab. Um, because typically we hold our trainings at a certain time of year, there's just a mad rush of like 150 meetings coming in. So we encourage you to try and enter those at least one month in advance prior to your meeting because um, the poor folks at ODA have to generate all of these codes, get them sent out to you, um, you know, and things happen. So just make sure that you allow yourself enough time to get those codes because we would hate for you to have all of these people show up, you know, at your county office for a training, but yet you haven't received your codes for whatever reason. So. Um, once you do enter your meetings into the portal, portal um, two things happen. Again, um, an email gets generated to the Ohio Department of Agriculture, which prompts them to generate the codes and get those sent out to you. I also get an email for every meeting that you enter, and then I will advertise that meeting on our web page. Okay. Um, here it says that they will be sending out recertification forms, and we're actually um, gonna try and get away from that instead of specifying how many recertification forms you need for each meeting that you enter in at in service this fall we are just going to be giving you all a stack of research forms that you can use for hopefully the next year or two or maybe even three therefore 
um, instead of Ryan having to mail you out your codes and recertification forms, he can just email you your codes and it'll be so much faster. Okay, a lot of you probably have research forms already in your office. As long as they have the one, two, three, four, five squares in the class ID and seven squares at the bottom for the session codes, you are more than welcome to use those. Um, apparently, because of how many meetings we're all holding every year, we can't reuse the codes. So now we're going to have to be going up to eight digits pretty soon. So I think next year they're going to have to make a new recertification form. But for the time being, the ones that you have are still good to go. So you don't need to get rid of those. Um, any questions on the ODA portal or entering your PAT or FACT meetings? Okay. So here is kind of a screenshot of our PestEd webpage where you can go to enter in your meetings. So again, if you hover over the ANR Educator tab, you can scroll down to PAT and FACT tools. And then to the right of that is register your PAT and FACT meeting. Once you click on that, this page will appear and you'll click on this bright teal box. And that will bring up the ODA portal where you can enter in all of your details. And we'll kind of go through that here in a little bit. Um, on occasion, there are educators who would like to host an exam. Um, let's say they have a new applicator training for people who want to get their private license. Um, you're welcome and we encourage you to hold those trainings in your counties. And you're also able to host an exam immediately following that training if you'd like. Um, there are some, a few things, a few criteria that you need to meet in, in order to be able to host an exam. I think you need to have like at least a minimum of 10 people there um, and you have to have it before one o'clock during the day. I can get you those details, but that is always an option for you as well. One thing to just to throw in there is it's the ODA that will come administer the exam. So when you host it, you don't actually administer it, the ODA does. Right, yes, someone from the ODA will come out and proctor that exam for you. Thanks, Mimi. Okay, similarly, if you're on our Nutrient Education webpage, um, again, from the Extension Educator tab, um, there are extension educator resources. You can access the um, ODA portal from that page as well. Register fertilizer certification in your county um, in the big red rectangle. So you can um, enter in your meetings from either website. Jen, I got a question. I guess I don't know this. It's, it's actually one portal, right? You just can access it from both our fertilizer and our pesticide sites? Correct. It's the exact same portal. I'm just trying to make your lives easier. Okay, so this is what the ODA portal will look like um, when you click on that big blue or big red square. So it's gonna ask for your username and password and hopefully you should all have been registered to be able to access this ODA portal, but your username is gonna be your first name and your password is gonna be your last name. So hopefully that's pretty easy to remember. Um, if once you try to access this and it's not letting you in, please just shoot me an email or give me a call and I can get in touch with ODA to make sure that they have you in their system. Um, in the meantime, if you're like in a super rush and you need to get a meeting entered in ASAP, you can always just use my name, Jennifer Anden, as kind of a backup, if you will. Plenty of educators have done that too. So this is what it'll look like. You put in your first and last name, and then you'll get this OSU recertif certification class request box that will pop up which should be pretty self-explanatory for the most part. You just enter in your county information, your contact information, and once you click this, whoops, I was thinking it was a live web page. Once you hit this extension county dropdown, um, all of this contact information should just automatically fill in. Um, if for whatever reason it's got maybe an educator's information from before, um, you were hired, you can just click the update button and then enter everything else in. Um, the same thing with your class um, location. It will kind of remember if you've chosen that location before, it'll remember it and you can just select that from your drop down menu and it will just automatically fill in those details for you. 
also on the other side of that, you'll have your program date, uh, your program start time, and the program type. Um, most of the time, it's just going to be your standard three hour uh, PAT meeting. And then at the bottom, you'll have the option of entering in your fertilizer recertification um, one hour. For the number of forms, if you will please just enter zero. Again, um, we're trying to get away from ODA having to pay for postage and mailing them out individually for each unique meeting that you have. We're just going to get a stack of them for you that, can, that you can use for at least one full training season, if not two. Okay. Um, so again, the standard PAT meeting is going to be three hours. It will not let you enter anything less than three hours or anything more than three hours. So let's say I just want to have a meeting where all I'm doing is an hour of core and a half an hour in fruit and vegetable. That would be considered a specialty meeting. Okay, so anything more or anything less than the standard three hours will be specialty. Okay, your video option here is going to be for makeups only. Um, but again, this is not something that you need to do because I have emailed everyone out some handy dandy universal video codes. Um, hopefully you all received those in a recent email. Please use those codes for anybody that comes in um, to your office to watch a video because they can't make one of your trainings for some reason. Either they're ill or they're snowbirds and they're down in Florida. Um, so again, so there, there have been eight codes designated for all educators to use for every single applicator that needs to watch a video. Okay, the only thing that you need to do is just date that certification form for March 31st of 2020. Is there anybody here that does not recall the universal code form that I emailed out several weeks ago? Okay, that is excellent. Um, there are some rare instances in which you can incorporate a video session into your three hour training. Um, again, if you've only got, you know, one or two people that need to catch that category three or category four, you are able to kind of tuck them away into a corner or into another room and let them watch that video while you're, you know, carrying on with your category six training. All right, so specialty again is gonna be anything more or less than the three hours. So for the folks who do like to offer all six or sometimes even seven categories, you will have to select specialty for that. Okay, again, this slide is um, sort of obsolete now as we are not going that route. So here's what it's going to look like once you enter in your standard um, PAT sessions. You'll just scroll down and kind of um, from the drop down menu select the category that you want and enter in the times. Um, it will not let you um, offer concurrent sessions. So let's say you want to offer two, you want to offer categories three and five also, but offer them both at 9:30 to 10. It will not let you do that. So you'll have to scroll down and just keep tacking on more time to that meeting, even though you might not have, you know, a six hour meeting. That's what it's going to kind of look like um, when that um, gets turned into the ODA. But we still know it's just going to be a three hour meeting that you just have concurrent sessions. So again, for those of you that want to offer more than the three hour um, PAT, You'll enter in your standard um, session up here under the standard session, and then under video specialty and additional sessions, this is where you'll enter in the remaining categories that you have left. And then finally down below, if you wanna do the standard PAT plus one, plus your fertilizer recertification, you'll just pop down here under the fertilizer sessions. There will be a drop down. Let me see if I've got a picture of that. Yeah, so there will be a drop down. Um, for the one hour recertification fertilizer session um, for you to add to your PAT. So you can add everything at once. You don't have to go in and enter just your pesticide stuff and then submit a separate form for your fertilizer. You can just do it all in one go. Um, once you enter in that, you just hit the submit button at the bottom and that generates the email that goes to the ODA and one that goes to me. Um, let's see. 
Okay, I'm going to go back. If you want to host a three-hour fertilizer um, training for those that don't already have the certificate, um, under program type, you will just simply enter fertilizer instead of the standard. And then you can go down to the bottom under fertilizer sessions and click on the three-hour first-time training. Okay, so the, the three-hour fertilizer certification trainings, those you will have to enter on their own. That typically not in conjunction with a PAT. Okay, again, just to kind of reiterate, the video sessions are typically used as sort of like a last resort, again, for anyone that is sick or just can't make your live meeting. Um, you should never have a standard PAT session where all you're offering is videos. Okay, most of it should be live. We understand occasionally you need to offer, you know, one category as a video, that's fine. Um, and you are welcome, if you do have those meetings where you have a portion of it as live training and a portion of it as videos, you can still use those video, the universal video codes that we sent out to you. But just make sure, again, if it's a video only program, that the date you enter on the recertification sheet is. March 31st of 2020. All right, so I'm going to kind of move on from the ODA portal to the CVENT portal. Do I have any questions over the ODA portal before I move on? Okay. And so, can I jump in? Can I jump in for a second? Yes. Um, of course, you know, you, this is all pretty technical stuff, and you're probably thinking, wow. Um, don't think that because you've attended this webinar, you've graduated and you know, you gotta, you gotta have it all in your head. Please call us. Um, I know Jen walks people through this all the time. So this oh, is yeah. your first exposure, but we're here to help you. Yeah, I'll tell you, I have seasoned educators. I mean, 20 years with the program who still can't remember what their username and password is for the ODA portal. <laughs> so it does happen. Yes, if for any reason you're having any issues with anything or just have any questions, our doors are always open. Um, I thought I heard somebody kind of pipe up with a question. Nope. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on to the online registration, which is unfortunately separate from the ODA portal. Um, I know it's essentially going to be the exact same information that you're entering in for both. And as much as we would like, there is not a way to link the two. So you do have to enter them in separately. Um, again, online registration is not required, but if you do want to offer credit card payment options for your applicators, unfortunately, this is the only way to do it. Okay, so to access the CVENT web form from our web page, um, again, you'll just go to the educator tab, scroll down, and you'll hit the CVENT registration form. Um, once you click on that, this is what it's going to look like. Um, again, it's pretty much going to be a lot of the same stuff you entered into the ODA portal to register your meeting in the first place. So um, basically, when you're using this CVENT web form, you're just kind of creating like a really small spreadsheet that's going to go to a CVENT relations expert who will then create the registration page in CVENT because there's CVENT can kind of be complicated and not everybody really, um, you know, fancies getting down to the nitty gritty of it, trying to create registration pages for all of their events. So um, don't fret. If you still want registration, we have help. We've probably got over 20 different people throughout the county who are designated as the CREs or volunteers, if you will, who have been trained to use CVENT. They will get your information from the CVENT web form and they will create the registration for you. Um, so once your registration is set up, they will send you a link before it goes live to make sure everything looks correct and as you would like it to appear. Then they send me the link and I post that on the web page. Okay, so um, again, you are not required to create this registration page, if you will. You're just required to enter in your details for the meeting into this web form that you see here on the page. 
Um, once you have entered in um, your CVENT information and the meeting has been set up, you will have access to CVENTs to the point where you can go in and check your registration lists. And I can explain that another time because that's kind of complicated. Um, there is a CVENT help button here that you can see that has um, all of the CREs for each county. So you can click on that and it will provide a list by county of who your CRE is. So if you have any questions about your meeting or you need to change anything for whatever reason, you can contact that person and they can you know, make it happen on the registration page. Do I have any questions on CVENT? Okay. So I believe this is back to Mimi. Yes. Just one last thing about CVENT. Um, I think it's worth pointing out. To the best of my knowledge, CVENT is the only credit card platform we have for any program at Ohio State. So yes. um, it's basically because of security for people's uh, credit card numbers. So, so you may be using that for other programs that you offer as well. Okay, now I'm going to talk briefly about the recertification forms that you will be using at your meetings. If I could get my slide to advance. <laughs> okay, whoops. Okay. Um, form security is something that we're required to consider. Uh, the stack of forms that Jenny talked about that you all get at in-service, starting right there, it's important that you keep those in a secure place. And then during the meetings, keeping them secure as well, too. Don't just leave them on a table so that people can come up and grab them. So, for, for example, with our own recertification programs, we're very careful that it's a one person per form. And if something happens to the form, like they request a new one because they messed it up or something like that, we we require them to give us the old form back before we give them a new one and tear up the old one. So another thing to help with security is to always read the session codes after each session. So instead of before where people can fill out the form and potentially walk out or go take phone calls. Um, each person has to sign their own form and turn it in. You will need to explain how to fill out the form correctly. Um, Miss uh, filled out forms is a problem a lot of times the ODA will contact us about. So properly filling out the form is very important. It is a triplicate form that you'll be using. Um, the white copy or top copy is going to be turned into you. Um, that's the one that you will return to the ODA. And the bottom copy, the pink copy, you'll also keep and file that. Uh, keep those forms for three years in your office. And the reason that we ask you to keep a copy in your office is uh, a situation where somebody uh, gets their license renewal and it shows that they didn't recertify. Um, there's all of a sudden this issue, I attended your program, but you know it's not showing up on my renewal. So you keep that copy, you're assisting your clientele. Um, all we have to do is go to the ODA, we show them the, the form, we fax them that form and they will give that person credit. This is what the, the recertification form looks like. It is used for both the pesticide PAT programs and the fact recertification program. So um, you will get an instruction sheet with the ODA forms that tells you how to fill this out. But basically that blue box is where the class ID and date go. And then the session codes go at the bottom. Those are the boxes at the bottom. Um, a real important point is that the initial fertilizer certification, okay, if you choose to have these in your counties, those are the three-hour programs that people take to get the fertilizer certificate. It's a completely different form. So make sure that you're not using the certification form for research. So once again, it's the same form for both pesticides and fertilizers for research. Jenny, anything you want to add about the form? Um, nope. Again, as long as the, the forms that they currently have look like this, 
they can still use them. Now, I think there's some old ones out there that only have four boxes in the class ID. Those will no longer work because the class IDs are five digits and the Ohio Department of Agriculture, um, they use a machine to scan these items. So if you write um, outside of the white boxes and start going into the blue area because you're using the wrong form, uh, the ODA gets a little bit ticked off about that. So make sure if you have class ID forms that are only four boxes, you get rid of those. Also make sure they sign their forms. That's very important. The ODA requires that signature. Now this next slide, I guess this is um, also no longer going to be valid since they're not going to be mailed the forms anymore, right Jen? Correct. Okay, so you can, you can skip this slide. Any questions about the research forms before I move on? Okay, in this next section, um, we're going to talk about the resources you get to help teach these programs. Uh, but the first slide is dealing with the issue of, you know, how do I get the background? How do I get the competency to teach these programs? And of course, new a and r educators come from a lot of backgrounds. You know, some of you have a master's in entomology or something like that, and it comes natural to you. But many a and r educators, uh, when they come on board, do not have this background. So this is just some suggestions. Um, we do offer a commercial new applicator school about seven times a year, where we spend a whole morning going over core. And, you are certainly welcome to contact us and come to this program. So that's one place that you could gain uh, a competency in core. Um, we also have a core exam prep course that's available online. Actually, that flash drive that we sent, um, that I sent all of you a couple of months ago, it has this in, uh, entire course on it. Um, but the online recordings are on our website. Third suggestion would be to actually study and pass the private pesticide and fertilizer applicator exams. So that's highly recommended. And then of course, there's the in-services. Um, pesticide in-service is actually taught at a fairly advanced level you will find. So it's not gonna really give you the basics. Um, nutrient in-service, however, um, Harold Waters, or I guess it's Greg Labarge, is offering this in November, and they are offering a more or less back to the basics type program to help bring newer educators up to speed on soil fertility. Then the last uh, recommendation I have is uh, the Certified Crop Advisor Program. Harold Waters teaches prep classes for this. Um, you may want to consider working on your CCA. Uh, even if you don't get the CCA, if that's not a goal immediately, just even attending his courses will give you a lot of background in soil fertility. So just a few suggestions. Obviously, it's going to take time. Can you get help with your meetings? Yes. Um, no new educator should feel like they have to start teaching PAT programs from scratch and teaching the whole thing by themselves. What really makes sense in your first year um, especially if you're one of the people that doesn't have a, a vast background in soil fertility or pesticides, is to go to your colleagues, neighboring counties, assist with them, get them to help you with yours, perhaps in that first year teach one session. As I mentioned before, um, for fact training, I believe Harold and Greg are still willing to travel to counties to do, to actually do some of the training and the research training as well. Yeah, Mimi, if I may. Sure. Um, yeah, it's actually very rare, even with the seasoned educators, it is very rare for them to sit there and teach an entire three hours of PAT. Um, I think every meeting that I've been to so far, there's at least two or three educators that are just kind of sharing, you know, going back and forth with the different presentations. So um, this doesn't have to be a first year, first year thing, you know, you should you shouldn't have to do the entire PAT on your own. There's usually always a neighboring educator that's willing to help out with your PATs as long as you kind of help out with theirs. Yeah, if you haven't experienced this already, it's great. It's just really a plus with OSU Extension, how the educators collaborate. And it is so much more interesting for the farmers to hear from a variety of people. Definitely. 
Okay, so what's all the stuff that you're going to get at pesticide in service? Um, our goal is to supply you with a, a wealth of materials that you can use in your PAT program, starting with the specialist presentations that they give at the actual two-day pesticide in-service. So come to in-service, you will hear their presentations. Um, we will also be recording those so that you can go back to them if you wish. And then we're going to put those actual PowerPoints in Buckeye Box immediately after the pesticide in service. And then furthermore, we're going to mail them to you on the flash drives within a couple of weeks, along with some other resources like the uh, like the Ohio private pesticide applicator database that Jen mentioned earlier. Um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, yes, the we do really encourage our our speakers to include notes in these PowerPoint presentations. So I'd say roughly about half of the speakers do this and those notes are for you um, to help you, I guess, learn the content. So this next slide is just a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with this, but if you haven't seen it, uh, the PowerPoint document itself has a space at the bottom where the, the notes can be typed in. So would you say, Jen, that about half of the specialists put the notes in there? <sighs> Maybe not half. <laughs> not, probably not quite half um, okay. give us, you know, good solid notes. Um, but that would it's be a ideal. a good idea if you're attending PAT in service to take your own notes as somebody who's gone through this a time or two. Yeah, so. good point, good point. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and we, um, sorry to interrupt, but we will oh no. print out all of the PowerPoints and provide them to you in a packet. So you'll have them there, you know, it'll be like six slides per page. We'll have those available for you and you can just follow along and take notes as you'd like. All right. All right, just a few tips. So you're a new educator and all of a sudden you have all of this material and it will be a lot. It'll be um, probably two core presentations and uh, maybe a couple of category one, et cetera, et cetera. So you're not gonna need everything that we give you. So what you wanna do is choose the presentations that you think are best for your clientele. Um, often, you know, frankly, the specialists may present these at a, a level that's quite technical in some cases, uh, more than you want for your clientele. You are certainly free to modify the presentation to fit your audience, to cut them down. Um, I, I've been to pesticide applicator trainings where the educator attempts to present absolutely everything that that extension specialist gave them an in-service and generally that is a mistake to be honest with you. So make it appropriate for your audience. Um, another thing is, is that you may really like a core presentation, for example, that was given two years ago. Knowing that most of your farmers are attending once every three years, typically in that last year, you can use presentations from previous years. There's nothing to say that um, you only can use what you're given in any given year. Now yeah, the you point can combine them. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, just take a couple slides from last year's and put them into this year's and yeah, absolutely anything that you want to do. As long as the information is still relevant, um, then go for it. Yeah, the last thing I do want to say is that I don't want to give the impression that it really is anything goes for PAT. The, the material that you're presenting really is supposed to be related to the category or core. If you're ever in doubt what is appropriate for the core, any of the categories, once again, just give us a call. So it's not to say that you can't make, uh, you know, spend five minutes talking about some important farm business aspect. You, you have that time to talk to your farmers, but once again, it's not appropriate to say this is a core program and talk about farm business or something like that. Okay, going on with the resources, in addition to those PowerPoints, we've already been talking a lot about the videos and video sessions. Well, what videos are we talking about? We're talking about ones that we have the specialists record each year. 
Um, these are also going to be provided to you on the flash drives. You'll get at least one hour core and at least 30 minutes in each of the, the categories. So as Jen has already described, this is useful for farmers that can't make a scheduled meeting, or you might occasionally use these even during your live PAT meetings where Eh, you only have one person at your meeting needing that specific category. So uh, point out these are also useful for self-study. There's been a real trend um, to develop interacting teaching resources. So, so far we've been talking about PowerPoints. Educators in the counties have really worked hard on uh, hands-on teaching activities. Um, and demonstrations. So we have a lot of these available to you in our Buckeye box. And each year at in-service, we attempt to have one or more activities as well. So this is something to, to keep in mind to really enrich your training. So I know you are gonna go out and you're gonna go to your colleagues' meetings this, this uh, winter and you'll, you will see this in action. The last point is that Mark Laux, our extension uh, weed uh, agronomist, um, he has been supplying weeds for ID activities. Um, he doesn't like to, he can't do this for every single county, but um, they've been supplying about, I don't know, something like 10 sets that counties can share. So this is something to keep in mind. I've been to these meetings where they have the weed ID activities for the farmers and it just works great. We are going to give you a proceedings book when you come to win service. We're actually going to give you enough for every participant in your meetings. And we use those lists that we get from the ODA every year to project how many to give each county. So what's the content in these books? Well, most of it comes from our extension specialists who are going to be speaking at the pesticide in service. Um, we also give core updates. Uh, there's pesticide law updates. Um, a lot of people will hand these out at the meetings and not mention anything about them. Um, it really is helpful if you take a look at these books and um, actually refer to them during the course of the meetings. Let your farmers know what kind of useful resources are in there. Um, some of the most useful in, uh, resources are the recommendations that the specialists provide. So for example, um, Ann Dorrance puts together a uh, a set of fungicide recommendations for agronomic crops every year in this guide. The last thing I want to mention is that there is a tear out evaluation form on the last page. So um, what this form is, is a simple evaluation of your PAT meeting. And I think my next slide goes into this. Yes. Um, we ask you to have everybody fill these out and then send your forms to us, okay? The reason we ask for this, it's not because we're evaluating you, okay? That is not our point at all. What we do is, one, a service to you. Um, we have students that will um, summarize these and mail you back um, an overview of the evaluation. But then what we do is we compile them for the entire state. And we can show administration that, you know, a thousand farmers went to PAT and this is how they felt about it. So um, please do use the form and send it in to us. Um, if I may jump in, Mimi. Of course. Um, we've had several educators come forward and say that if the educator themselves tear the evaluation out first before the meeting and stick it in the front of the book, you're much more likely to have them turn it in. I don't know why, versus if you wait until the end of the meeting and say, hey, please fill this out, tear it out and turn it in. If you already have it in the front of the book for them before, they, before the meeting has started, they can fill it out during the training and they're much more likely to turn it in. So that's just two cents for you. Okay. By the way, there's other types of interactive demonstrations going on in the counties. There's probably about oh, half dozen or eight of these demonstration spray tables that people are using for core uh, recertification. Uh, we also have one of these units that can be borrowed. So there's really a lot of interesting things that the county educators are doing. They're not just solely using the PowerPoints, although that's still the backbone of pesticide research. 
All right, I'll turn it over to Jen. All right, so we are gonna touch on worker protection standards just a little bit. There's kind of a lot to it. Um, so these are the federal regulations designed to prevent pesticide exposure to agricultural work workers and handlers. And if you're not familiar with the Worker Protection Standard Handbook, it is quite lengthy. Um, you are able to um, download a PDF from our website and take a peek if you want to. Um, but mainly it's designed so that there are universal guidelines for employers of farm workers and pesticide applicators so that they're offering and affording them the protections that they are entitled to. Um, in terms of family farms, there are a lot of exemptions that take place, but owners still have key responsibilities to their employees. Um, and this is um, going to include entry restrictions after a pesticide application has been made, um, the personal protective equipment that's required, um, and that will include also the new respiratory protection guidelines that are now in place. So if you're not familiar with work protection standards in terms of the pesticide label, um, you will see on a label that there will be both agricultural use requirements and non-agricultural use requirements. Um, that is because the same pesticide might be labeled for, say, turf grass. I seem to like that example. Um, but it also might be labeled to use on an agricultural commodity. So when you're making an application to an agricultural commodity, you've got to take into consideration that your farm hands, your harvesters, these people are going to be in these fields day in and day out, probably, you know, for most of their lives. So you can imagine that the PPE that they have to wear is going to be higher than, you know, say a homeowner who walks out into their lawn, you know, two hours after an application to make, to take their dog out. Um, so the restricted entry interval is going to be much longer for that of an agricultural worker than it is for a non-agricultural application. More often than not, if it's a non-agricultural use application, the restricted entry interval or the REI is typically going to be, not always, but typically when that product has dried, you may re-enter that, that area. Okay, but you will notice on an individual pesticide label, that the REI and the PPE will vary depending on how you are using that pesticide. So this is what the manual looks like. Again, you can access this from our webpage. It is pretty thick. Um, there is kind of a lot to it. Um, I, you are not required to know the absolute ins and outs of every single page on this. I just wanna make you aware of it that this is a resource um, available to you for, um, you know, farms that have employees, they have workers and handlers, that they do need to require, they do need to um, apply these to their, their farm hands and their workers to keep them safe. Um, so in most cases, this is going to take effect for horticultural growers. Um, if you have any questions about this or questions come up, um, please feel free to contact Mimi or I. Again, it's kind of complex. We've offered trainings around the state that are three hours just talking about WPS. So I just again wanted to kind of make you aware of this for employers of workers and handlers. Oops, the wrong way. So the requirements are going to include worker safety training, um, posting of pesticide applications, um, application signage or verbal warnings, Restrictions during applications, um, decontamination supplies, emergency assistance, and record keeping. And this is something that the ODA enforces. Um, the WPS inspections are quite um, lengthy, um, but they do enforce this and they will come out and inspect. Um, Mimi, is this back to you? Well, um, for basically, in our last couple of slides here, we just want to make you know who your resource people are. So, you know, the extension specialists are the source of uh, most of the material that we supply to you. And they are the source of our research-based recommendations for our clientele. So just wanna encourage you as much as possible to get to know your extension specialist. Um, we're really fortunate at Ohio State that we have a lot of talent. 
then there's our program. We are here for you. You know, please call us. We can provide you with uh, general pesticide information, uh, training resources, anything you need to know about conducting these meetings, anything we talked about in this webinar, please give us a call. Um, just so you know who we all are, um, Jen and I are the ones that are giving you this webinar today. Jen is a program manager on the private applicator side of things. Um, we also have Chrissy Kaminsky in our program who more or less emphasizes in, uh, uh, the commercial applicator side of things. And then Adam Ziada, he is our program assistant. So if you call the office, you're gonna talk first to Adam, but of course you're willing, you can call uh, any of us directly as well. The ODA is also a resource to you and they are happy to receive calls from a &R educators. So you can call Matt Beal, who's in charge of pesticides, um, Ryan King, who's currently in charge of certification and training. Uh, things are possibly changing a bit at the ODA, so we may have some new people involved here too. I also wanted to make you aware that your, um, your ANR colleagues are on an advisory committee for our program. Um, he, here are the people that are on that advisory committee. Um, so we are really wanting input from the counties about how we can provide better for you. And every year we meet twice to talk about things like pesticide in-service and some of the issues involved with pesticides and, and get your input. But you're, any of you, um, we welcome your input to our program. So that's pretty much it for our webinar today. Um, we hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, if there's questions now, we'll open it up. Um, Jen's going to send you a really short, like six question online survey. And if you can just give us a little feedback about whether this was helpful and, you know, if there's any other things you would have liked to have heard about, it would be great if you could fill that out. So just open it up to questions.